Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at the role of indigenous peoples in dealing with a wide range of issues such as conservation, sustainable development, and climate change. My guest is an expert on these topics. Dr. Mordecai Ogata, a Kenyan national, is a carnivore ecologist involved in conservation work for 20 years with communities in Kenya and other parts of Africa. Dr. Ogata, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be here. I appreciate you being with me today. Yeah. We've got some very important topics to get into. Indeed. But uh, you're also the director of the Conservation Solutions Africa. Yes. Africa with a K, not yes. with a yes, C, with right? A K. What is this organization uh, that uh, that you're uh, heading up? This organization is it's it's not a continental one. It's a, it's pretty local. It's a small consultancy that I run with the three other partners, and we work on natural resources, resource management plans, mm -hmm. environmental impact assessments, sort of helping local people develop sustainable ways of using forests, rivers, and whatever natural resources they have access to, just so that they keep it intact as they go about their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. Which is very important. Indeed. Extremely yeah. important. Yeah. And your website is www.csa.or.ke. Correct. Yeah. That's correct. Okay, great. Also, I didn't mention, but you were the co-author of a book, The Big Conservation Lie. Yes. What is the theme of that book? The theme of that book is uh, the the ethical challenges and problems that uh, that occur in conservation, particularly in Africa and, and Kenya, where I come from. For many years, conservation has been a field that has not been examined very closely because it is thought to be a beyond reproach. It's th we're the good guys we are conserving. Mm -hmm. But it's not without its challenges. Some of them include uh, human rights violations. Some of them include uh, Lo disenfranchisement of locals, loss of access to resources and access to lands. So I conservation is a good cause, but it's complex. And the problems occur because people still try and do it, mm -hmm. uh, pursue it simply. Mm. Now, Kenya is a country of about 45 million people, about 580,000 square kilometers, Correct. about 350,000 square miles, that type of thing. It's a large country. Indeed. Very large yeah. country. Have you seen more of a movement towards focusing on conservation uh, as opposed to maybe five years ago or 10 years ago? Or is there movement in that area? I know we have much mm. more to do. We're not, we certainly haven't uh, won in this topic, on this topic, but. Yes, conservation, in initially it was all about the state organ, Kenya Wildlife Service or the Wildlife Department before that. But in the last uh, 10 or so years, NGOs, civil society, nonprofits have really stepped in and, and uh, upped their game. And they're the ones who really need to rethink some of their approaches because they've become very big. They've done a lot of good work, but a lot of the problems are occurring in the areas where they, they are working. Mm -hmm. Because they're not, they, they have a lot of authority and they have resources but they don't have the sort of strictures and, and sort of adherence to procedure that a state organization has. That's why they, they need to think a lot more carefully about how, mm -hmm. how they pursue conservation because they're pursuing it in lands that are currently occupied by people, not national parks. Mm -hmm. The state organs have it simple because a national park, there's no people in there. So you're just managing wildlife. But if you're trying to do conservation outside national parks, it's a lot more complex and you need to think about it a lot carefully. Mm -hmm. Now, one term you hear quite often is protected areas. Yeah. Are we really talking about the national parks when we say protected areas, or uh, is it broader than that? Initially, it was national parks, but it's mm -hmm. becoming broader. There are other classes, if you will, of protected areas. Some are called conservancies, some are reserves, etc. And um, the, these are the ones that are getting rather complicated because you need to protect an environment and the wildlife therein. But there are people who are sometimes just using it for grazing. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's an area where people are actually living. So you have to look for a lot of sophisticated methods to keep wildlife safe from people, people safe from wildlife, to keep migration routes for open for both people and migration routes open for both people and wildlife. So that's that's where the problems occur that we dealt with in the book, The Big Conservation Lie. And, and um, that's the area where we really need to be agile and keep changing things to meet new realities. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very important to do that, yeah. And you were talking about 
fencing and that type of thing, yeah. it uh, would be very difficult. First of all, it would be very expensive yes. to build a fence. So yes. <laughs> I can just imagine yes. across parts of Kenya or all the way across Africa, wherever yes. it might be. But yeah, animals take natural paths of migration. They go, the wildebeest travel from point A to point yes. B every year, and they're not going to pay attention to a fence, or elephants will not pay attention yes. to a fence. They're yeah. going to do what they need to do. So there got to be other approaches instead of some of these that we're looking at right now. Yeah, yes, you, you're right. And fencing is very popular, but is is now is now unworkable. I think I think mm -hmm. that uh, it's it's no longer relevant to, to, to as a conservation tool. Yet people are still doing it as as you say. It's very expensive. It's a source of conflict. Sometimes they're putting up fences between people and resources they need to use, people and places they need to visit. And uh, the wildlife as well. You have elephants. They, if you fence elephants inside a confined place, they'll trash it. Mm -hmm. They'll destroy every tree you got there. And right now, there's a project fencing Mount Kenya Forest, which is bizarre if you think about it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. someone's doing it. So we, n we really need to look closely at um, these approaches. And even if we are doing fencing, it has to be designed in a way Maybe you can make small man-sized gates so people can pass through it. If you're fencing for elephants, have it six or seven feet, two strands six or seven feet high so everything else can pass under it and that kind of thing. But absolute fencing and physical barriers, we can no longer do that. Certainly not in Kenya with our population and the space people and wildlife need. Yeah. Now, in 1948, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, the UN Declaration for Human Rights, which has been really one of the gold standards of yeah, human yeah, rights documents, yes, without yes. a doubt, if not the gold standard. Yeah. And But today we're hearing, it was written in very broad terms, it was very inclusive to a large degree, but there were items that were not included. Today we look at uh, conservation, we look at uh, mm -hmm. preserving the environment, combating yes. climate change, we look at living in a safe, healthy environment as a human right, how, how do you view that? Yes, I, I, I fully agree with that. Living in a safe and healthy environment and the, ab the, ability, the ability to move when you need to. Because in a lot of these arid areas of, of Kenya and Africa and other parts of the world, the resilience of communities or their resilience to climate change is absolutely dependent on the ability to move mm -hmm. to another place for a few weeks or a few months because that's where water is, move to another place because there's grazing for their livestock there. If we curtail the movement of these people, literally it's, it's, like, a, it's like a slow death for them, really. And we are completely mm -hmm. compromising their resilience. So we must keep an eye on that. Now that we have the state of knowledge on climate change now, we have the science, we have the knowledge. So now let's try and apply it to what we are doing. People who have the knowledge about climate change should not be doing fencing. Now, when we talk about the human rights violations in conjunction with conservation, mm -hmm. uh, what are there some recommendations? I know you mentioned mm -hmm. fencing and that mm -hmm. type of thing. Are there other recommendations that would help focus the spotlight on human rights and to make sure that they're not violated? Yes, the, it's important that conservation is brought under the same sort of umbrella of examination that we bring in mining, um, mm -hmm. infrastructure mm -hmm. development, ex other extractive industries because there are sets of guidelines for those. But in conservation, one example that's a big problem in Africa is basically extra, extrajudicial killings. You find a robber or any other criminal will be arrested. Mm -hmm. But if someone is seen inside a national park, anywhere near where there's rhinos or elephants, they get shot and it's shoot to kill. This happens quite often in Kenya, in many African countries, as part of conservation. And the problem is that it's accepted. It does not meet with the same disapproval that you would find if someone maybe shot demonstrators in the street protesting mm -hmm. over something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cause the uproar. In fact, if you look at responses of people, a lot of times it's, it's happiness. There's a lot, it's, it's widely believed that poachers deserve to die. That's a widely held belief, unfortunate as it is. So. We have to sort of step back and realize that conservation is just like everybody else. It has its failings, its weaknesses, and we have to hold it to the same strict standards that we hold human rights in all other fields. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, is this a general practice? I was not aware of that. I know poaching is a major problem. It is. There's no doubt about Indeed, that. Yeah. And uh, we're seeing 
tremendous loss with lions, elephants, mm -hmm. even giraffes. Rhin right, rhinos. Rhinos. Right now. rhinos. rhinos. Mm -hmm. Well, they're almost extinct mm -hmm. in some yeah. areas. Yeah. And as this is a major problem, but I did not realize that they had a shoot-to-kill policy. Yeah. Is that pretty prevalent? Uh, and I know there are 54 Afri er, countries in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you can't say for every one of them. Is that prevalent, like it's in Kenya, it's in it's pretty South it's Africa, yeah. other countries like that? Yeah, it's pretty prevalent in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, rangers, wildlife rangers are in law enforcement, but mm -hmm. they very rarely, I've, I've not seen any of them carrying handcuffs. It's like they're not, they're not, they're going out on patrol, but not prepared to arrest anyone. Mm -hmm. It's, it's almost, we are turning conservation into something like war, which it shouldn't be. And the cons conservation, and the people who support conservation causes generally are peace loving kind of people. So they, that's sort of mm -hmm. the big conservation lie in a nutshell. There's, there's this, there's this cognitive dissonance between what we believe and uh, and hold, and then what and what happens on the ground in conservation. Right. Yeah. Now, in many cases, the poachers are doing it because maybe they're hungry, they need the money, whatever. They get big money for rhino yeah, horns or whatever. Uh, ivory is very but valuable. Yeah. Ivory is very mm. valuable. Elephant tusks, that yeah. type of thing. Mm. What can we do to get the poachers to stop from poaching? <laughs> That's that is the critical thing. Um, law enforcement, first of all, is v is very important. Uh, in Kenya, for example, where I come from, law enforcement has been pretty effective. Right now, a com any common person would not know where to go if he had a task to sell. He would not know where to take it. The best, the best thing you would do is maybe throw it in the nearest ditch and walk away and don't look back. So mm -hmm. law enforcement has really tightened the screws. But one thing that escapes us is that a lot of countries still trade in ivory. The EU still trades in ivory. The UK is still the world's number one ivory trader. And as long as these markets are there and lucrative mm -hmm. as they are, there will always be some people looking to get ivory into there. And when, I, when hunting was banned, like all commodities, people had stockpiles of ivory. And, and some of them, that's what's getting into the market now. It's not like fresh killings, but mm -hmm. it's from old big stockpiles of ivory. <laughs> and um, as long as Europe still holds these market, this legal trade for ivory, it will find its way into the market. And I think European countries, the UK, etc., need to start by banning it at home mm -hmm. before they come and start prescribing measures for African countries to take. After all, like Kenya banned it in 1979. So we, we are far ahead of where they are mm -hmm. as, far, as far as ivory trade is concerned. Mm -hmm. And a parallel issue that the United States has discovered, and many other countries too, as long as you have the demand, the supply will be there. Yes. And you look at, yes. look at the drug situation, yes. drugs coming from, the, uh, from Canada, from Mexico, other parts of the Caribbean, Correct. what have you. As long as you have people consuming them, yes. there will be the demand, yes. and we're going to have to deal with that problem. Yes. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a computer, you have a website, you like our program and you'd like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're taking a look at the issue of conservation, climate change, and uh, human rights all rolled into one and to see what indigenous peoples are doing or what we can do in the future to help make sure that we have a, a livable planet for future generations. My guest today is an expert in this area. Dr. Mordecai Ogata is the Director of Conservation Solutions Africa. He's also the co-author of The Big Conservation Lie. This, this situation with climate change, well, this climate change, we haven't gotten really into climate change, but yes. it all ties together. Yes. And uh, I mentioned indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to focus on indigenous peoples now. Yeah. One of the reasons you're in the United States is because you're at, a, at an indigenous peoples conference yes. here at the United Nations. Yes. But I'm um, just curious, how many different indigenous or ethnic groups, I guess we should say, in Kenya, the 45 million people, how many would you say are ethnic groups versus indigenous, actually the original ancestors of a particular yeah. area? Yeah, yeah, it's very complex. We have 42 ethnic groups in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I'm not sure. I still struggle to find with where, where we came up with the criteria to define some as indigenous and others otherwise. Because those that are defined as indigenous groups in Kenya are less mm -hmm. than 10. Yet the others are not people who sort of came, I immigrated from other places. Their, their, their ancestry is in, is in Kenya as far as uh, history can record. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to sort mm -hmm. of redefine the issue of indigenous people at a higher resolution so that we are not using the same formula for New Zealand or Australia as we are using for Kenya. Mm -hmm. Because contexts are so different. In, 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 in Europe it's different, in Asia it's different, uh, again Australia, Asia, South America as well it's different. It's different especially in some countries where you have the dominant, the dominant population is actually of immigrant mm -hmm. or, or origin. And, mm -hmm. and uh, in Africa and Kenya, where I, where I come from, that's not the case. So the indigenous net must be cast a lot wider. <laughs> a lot <laughs> wider. Certainly, we yeah. have to come up with a new definition yes, or, or, yeah. or delineation. So yeah. like, yes. And you mentioned Australia and New Zealand. you got the Maoris in yes. New Zealand, Aborigines yes. in Australia. Of course, yeah. Australia is a continent. Yeah. New Zealand yeah. Yeah. is an island yeah. out there. They're right together. So it's a little harder for groups to migrate. But in Kenya, yeah. people can come across some yes. borders from yes. neighboring countries. Yes. But you're right. We do need a new definition. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, been a conference. This is, uh, this is the 18th, as I recall, yes. UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Uh, this is your first visit here. But Indeed. What, what was the purpose of, of the, what was the purpose of this conference and why did you want to participate? Yeah, the purpose of a conference is to, <coughs> to make sure that the, the human rights, basically, of indigenous <coughs> populations around the world are protected from, from the stresses that might come either due to infrastructure development, uh, extractive <coughs> industries, agribusiness, etc., etc., so that they have the right to live in a healthy environment and live as they see fit. And my part, on, my part in this was to sort of include the issues around conservation because mining, oil exploration, etc., have all come under the microscope uh, over their impacts on environments and indigenous people. But conservation very much has flu sort of flown under the radar on this and mm -hmm. has not been recognized widely as a stressor on the livelihoods of indigenous people. Yet it does compromise access to resources, especially when conservation is about protected areas, when it's delineated geographically. It means you can't go a certain place, you can't fetch water from a certain river, you can't graze your animals in a certain place. So conservation in the context of protected areas is a serious human rights issue. And that's, that was my, my part in this conference. At first, I ex mm -hmm. attended the experts general meeting in Nairobi in this last January, and th thereafter I got invited to this one. And I think we've made some good uh, traction on the issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you gave a speech at the yes, I group. yes, I just yes. gave gave a talk a short while ago, and I illustrated some of these points, including uh, the increased militarization of uh, of conservation practice. Mm -hmm. The the criminalization or, or vilification of indigenous populations vis-a-vis -vis conservation. And it's uh, because I felt it's important that they're seen as partners. Too, too often conservation sees local indigenous people as, as some sort of client population or as a problem mm -hmm. that needs to be changed. We need to teach them how to do this. We need to create awareness and, uh, and such, as, such like terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that about the criminalization. This was a resolution, I guess, that came mm -hmm. out of the conference, mm -hmm. and there's going to be an international campaign yes. against against the criminalization of yeah. indigenous peoples. Yeah. And as I understand it, I think this would be directed mostly, maybe not completely, to help indigenous peoples who are defending their own land. Yeah. We we see it in different. We've seen it in Brazil. We've seen it in Ecuador. We've seen it in the United States yeah. with the Keystone XL pipeline yeah. coming from Alberta, Canada, going down to the Gulf of Mexico. Basically, that the the Native Amer the, yeah the Native Americans really are under siege in that area yes. because they want to run this pipeline across their territory. Yes, and if there were a pipeline disaster, a spill, it could destroy one of the largest aquifers in the country. I think it's a yeah, Ogallala yeah, yes, aquifer. Yeah. So this is a major problem. Is, is that what we're talking about here mostly or, or yeah, are there yeah, other parts yes, to that, it? Yes, that's, that's, that's a huge <coughs> chunk of it. But in, in, in Africa and in Kenya, 
it's it's slightly different mm -hmm. in that the criminalization is usually in regards to the wild animals. Um, you find there'll be there'll be very slow response, or sometimes none at all, when there's human wildlife conflict. Maybe an elephant kicked someone, atta attacked someone, or something, mm -hmm. and uh, there might be very slow response. There might be no compensation, but. On the other hand, if a conflict uh, um, incident occurred, like an elephant raided someone's farm mm -hmm. and they got a group together and maybe speared it and killed it, you find there's an immediate response and very, very harsh punitive response to that. And that's the sort of criminalization that assumes, conservation in Africa is too widely assumes that local people, African wildlife is in peril and local people are the source of that peril. For example, when people talk about wildlife in Africa being endangered, no one says you need to stop the sport hunting. No one says that. Because mm -hmm. somehow mm -hmm. sport hunters not, are not seen as a danger to wildlife, yet they, that's what they mm -hmm. do, they kill mm -hmm. wildlife. I've visited some sport hunters' homes in the, in here in the US where they have a stunning array of specimens. Mm -hmm. They just harvested. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt started this back in <coughs> 1909, I think. Teddy Roosevelt, yeah, former he, president he, yeah, yes. of the United States. Yeah, yeah. And he harvested <coughs> huge numbers. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, always, it's always been a fascinating thing going sport hunting in Africa. But it's never been a seen as, mm -hmm. a, as one of the threats to African wildlife. Mm -hmm. Yet, any conflict with local people is seen as a threat to African wildlife. Mm -hmm. So we just need we don't need preferential treatment. I think we just need fair treatment across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, far be it for me to defend the trophy hunters <laughs> <laughs> because I'm opposed to it personally. <laughs> but their argument is that they charge mm -hmm. lots of money mm -hmm. for these hunters to mm -hmm. come in to yeah, shoot yes, it is these animals. And then they use a large part of this money to preserve the animals and to expand their population. I don't know if that's true in every case or not. Is that a legitimate argument or is it's, it not? It's a widely used argument, but it is uh, it, it, in theory, that, that looks like a workable mm -hmm. arrangement. But in practice, the vast amount of mon the money goes to the safari outfitter. Mm -hmm, sure. Many times, who is actually someone <coughs> even based he in Europe or in the US. Exactly, yeah, London and yeah, New York. Yeah, 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 yeah. and, and, and um, that, that the, the in practice, it doesn't work that way. And and uh, it's 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 always a mm -hmm. it's always a source of tension. One of the other things that they often say is like we give out the the meat from these hunted animals to local people to to eat and all that, and that that sort of that's a flawed argument because if these guys wanted to eat buffalo meat for they don't have to wait for Mr X from another country mm -hmm. to come and mm -hmm. kill a buffalo, they'd wipe out the buffaloes. They'd eat them. So it's it's. Um, it's it's a sort of justification. It's it's something after the fact to make something that's problematic look good. Mm -hmm. In practice, mm -hmm. it doesn't quite work that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, in our last thirty seconds, what hardest question yet? What do you see as the major, the biggest challenge confronting this whole topic that we've been talking about today? I think conservation just needs to be treated as a principle. Uh, rather than rather than as as some sort of business and all that, and when we are deciding what to do about conservation, get the tourist guys out of the room. We should not have tourist interests in the room where we are discussing conservation, because mm -hmm. tourism is a business. Conservation is a is a principle. Once we get the conservation right without them, then we'll have a nice environment and nice animals, and they're welcome to come and share and partake mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. But many governments fail, in including Kenya. We have a Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife, two things which, in my opinion, should never be combined in under the same roof mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they, they bleed into each other and just mess, mm -hmm. mess up the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, people are moving towards ecotourism, coming in, looking, shooting animals with cameras <laughs> and not yeah. with guns, that type of thing. And of course, this is a major problem, and we're losing so many species mm -hmm. that are just disappearing. We see, we talked about it earlier today, that so many of these animals are just on the brink of extinction. Yeah. And once they're gone, they're probably not going to come back that's unless there's some kind it. of a miraculous DNA <laughs> resurrection, which uh, I'm not going to put my money on that one, but it no, may happen. No. We, we can see what happens. But again, this is such a very important topic, yes. and it's one that we've got to focus upon. And the indigenous peoples around the world play a critical role, and they're right on the front line. They're so often the victims of the developers who come in who want mm -hmm. to destroy the Amazon rain yeah. forest to plant uh, 
Soy props, bean, that type yeah, of thing, yeah. and you cannot do that. But Dr. Ogata, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you very much for having me. It's been my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank yeah, you, sir. Right. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.